Good evening. Welcome to our service tonight at Thompson Road Baptist Church. We'll begin by singing our hymn of the month. Would you stand with me as we sing, In God We Trust, In God Alone? We'll sing all four verses. We pray for peace and plead for grace. We bow our knees in humbleness. We cry to God to heal our land. Forgive our sins and cleanse our hands. In God we trust. sits on heaven's throne. Though man of earth will rise and fall, our only hope is in the Lord of all. In God we trust. In God alone. Oh, let us rest in God's control. And honor those he put in power. For hearts of kings are in his hand. The nations turn at his command. In God we trust, in God alone. We put our faith in him who sits on heaven's throne. Though man of earth will rise and fall, our only hope is in the Lord of all. In God we trust, in God alone. Protect the weak, establish law. Honor the right, punish the wrong. Let this be true of those who lead. O men of faith, now intercede. In God we trust, in God alone. We put our faith in him who sits on heaven's throne. trust in God alone. If persecution soon will come, help me to stand if all alone. And though my life he may call forth, God's kingdom is not of this earth. God we trust, in God alone, we put our faith in him who sits on heaven's throne. Though men of earth will rise and fall, our only hope is in the Lord of all, in God we trust, in God alone. And remain standing for prayer, please. Hope that song will be an encouragement and a challenge to stir us as we continue to learn it. We're also continuing to learn a couple of verses. I want to bring back a verse for review, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 3. And would you say that with me? I'll say the reference first together. Philippians 2, 3. Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. And then our verse for this month, that uh, a song we sang might remind you of as we talk about our trust in God, Psalm 20, verse 7, some trust in chariots, some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Let's say that together, reference first. Psalm 27, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God. Let's pray together. Lord, we remember your name this evening, and we place our trust in you and in you alone. 
Lord, we thank you that our citizenship is in heaven for those that are believers that our kingdom is not of this earth but uh, in these days ahead lord we know that you have much for us to do we know that the needs are great we know that uh, darkness will probably increase uh, in the days ahead here in our culture and so lord help us to stand even if alone even if persecution comes but lord we just trust in your promise that uh, the church will prevail, that you will continue to uh, grow your people through it and continue to reach lost souls here and across the world. Help us to be part of that. Lord, thank you for a special night tonight uh, just to gather as your house with your people uh, around your word and just praise you for the things that you've done and uh, be challenged by scripture. We pray that you would bless those that aren't able to be with us, those that are traveling those that are sick or at risk. We pray that you'd protect them, feed them from your word, and bring them back again soon. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. You may be seated. Just want to remind you about the food drive. You see those bins. There are a couple at the exit here, one by door five over here if you come in from the east side of the building. And those will continue to uh, be available through December 6th. So this next uh, three weeks, uh, of, of Sunday services and Wednesdays, of course, or if you, it's better for you to drop things by during the week. We'd like to get a good uh, collection of non-perishable items to help with needy families in our community and to answer the call from good news that gets a lot more uh, traffic, a lot more needy people, hungry mouths this time of year. And so that's an opportunity to be a blessing. The missionary adoption list is on the bulletin board. Just a couple more weeks, a chance for you to do so if you haven't already signed up for one or to sign up for a second if you're so led. And uh, we'll look forward to our hour of thanks next Sunday morning. Hope you can be here for that as we reflect on the Lord's blessings that he's shed on us this past year. I want to mention one more thing that I was just told by Angela Madison is uh, be in prayer for Jason and Felicia. We've been praying for uh, the Felicia and them as they've been battling COVID-19, but uh, also uh, just this afternoon, uh, Jason's been having some heart uh, trouble, uh, just not feeling well, and so Felicia has taken him to the hospital right now. Uh, and of course, knowing the Madison family history, they're uh, definitely wanting to take that seriously. So I'm sure they would appreciate your prayers for him and uh, try to uh, figure out what's going on with him. Our next song is Soldiers of Christ Arise, and we'll sing the first two verses of this. And before we start singing, there's a phrase in this verse that uh, as I was looking at and thinking about singing which verses we would uh, sing, I looked at it and I'm like, I don't know what that means. And in, in verse 2, it says, and take to arm you for the fight, the panoply of God. How many of you know, just offhand, because you use that word every day, what panoply means? <laughs> okay, we've, we've got, I thought Pastor Slutes might know. Anybody else? Did I see anybody? Or, or, Pastor Slutes, what does panoply me, mean? Armor, armor. I, I looked it up and it said basically the complete or entire armor of God. So this, the second verse, when we get to it you, and it says panoply of God, you know it's the entire armor of God. So let's stand again and sing the first two verses of Soldiers of Christ Arise. Soldiers of Christ arise and put your armor strength which God supplies through his eternal Son, strong in the Lord of hosts and in his mighty power, who in the strength of Jesus trust is more than conqueror. Stand then in his great might with all his strength endued, and take to arm you for the fight, the panoply of God, that having all things done, and all your conflicts past, ye may overcome through Christ alone, and stand in time. 
we'll sing the next song, 120. Calvary covers it all. We're thankful for the work of Christ. We'll sing all three verses of number 120. Calvary covers it all. Far dearer than all that the world can impart was the message that came to my heart. How that Jesus alone for my sin did atone and Calvary covers it all. Calvary covers be seated and Angela and Madison will come and sing for us now.
each night and each day. I can't my soul to the Savior's control. He drives all fear away. How can I feel Jesus is near? He watches Thank you, Angela. Well, let's join our voices one more time. Would you stand with me as we sing, I love to tell the story. I trust that you truly do love to tell the story because it's your own story, a story of salvation, to tell of Jesus' great love for us. So we'll sing the first, the third, and the fourth verse. I love to tell the story of unseen things above. And his glory of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story because I know it is true. Twill fill his eyes my longings as nothing else can do. I love to tell. and his love. I love to tell the story, tis pleasant to repeat. What seems each time I tell it, more wonderfully sweet. I love to tell the story, for some have never seated and I just want to say one more thing before Pastor Joel introduces our guest speaker as you think about the old old story I trust that that is your story and as we have our Thanksgiving praise service coming up next Tuesday we uh, you may think you know uh, what would I say at a Thanksgiving praise service I don't typically say something uh, but I know every single one of us we have something to be thankful for if we know Jesus Christ as your Savior so I would encourage you to think about maybe giving a, a five-minute testimony of how you came to Christ, and so we can rejoice with you as we hear a, a, a story, your story, of how Jesus saved you from your sins. So I just want to make that plug for our Thanksgiving praise service a week from Tuesday.
You can start thinking about that and uh, appreciate the music tonight. Thanks for singing and for those who play. And uh, thank you, Angela, for that. I don't know how many of us could sing How Can I Fear while your son is in the hospital. That's, that's an example of the endurance through trials that we have through our faith in the Lord that we looked at this morning in James. Well, we're excited to have with us tonight uh, Steve and Judy Folks. They are with Baptist Mid Missions, and you're familiar with the different missions agencies that we have that our missionaries go out through. There are several of them that we have missionaries under, and the missions uh, boards uh, provide uh, guidance and accountability and uh, a way to to, uh, channel the resources and just... um, be a, a help and a count, source of counsel for our missionaries on the field. Just a vital, very important ministry that they have. Baptist Mid Missions is the board for uh, Michelle and Harrison Banda and Ed and Sylvia Christie in France, both sent out of this church, as well as uh, JJ and Valerie Shalichenko uh, that we support as well in France. And so we appreciate Baptist Mid Missions, and they are. Uh, celebrating a milestone in that ministry today that Mr. Folks will share with you. He is the, uh, one of the vice presidents and the administrator of, for operations at Baptist Mid Missions. He has background in Christian school teaching and as a principal in Christian school. He was a, he's been an assistant pastor. He's been a pastor. Uh, they've been missionaries in Peru and now for upwards of 20 years, I believe, uh, on the administrative staff uh, there at Baptist Mid. So uh, brothers, folks, would you come? And we're looking forward to uh, being encouraged by what the Lord has on your heart time. Thank you, Pastor. Good evening, everyone. It is a joy to be with you. Today is a very special day. I will talk about a very special day a month ago. But today, across the country, we are celebrating Thanksgiving Sunday for Baptist Midmissions. We have produced a video, which I'm going to show you in just a moment. And that video is produced and is given by our president as we thank churches for partnering with us over the last 100 years. Uh, We had the idea that it would be nice if churches would want it to have an administrator in a church on this very special day. And all 12 of us are somewhere today. So we're very grateful that you invited us in. And we will allow you to see the video right now and then I will come back and open the Word of God and tell you just a little bit about what He has done through Baptist Midmissions. Baptist Midmissions has just celebrated its 100th anniversary. We want to thank your church for the part that you have played in partnering with us in fulfilling the Great Commission. In 1920, our founders set forth a vision that was twofold. First, they wanted to reach the millions of souls for whom Christ died, still waiting to hear the good news of Jesus Christ. Secondly, it was their burden to awaken the churches of the United States in regards to their responsibility to take the gospel to the world. Thankful today that churches like yours have partnered with us Churches that have embraced their responsibility to fulfill the Great Commission. Churches that have sent out and supported a missionary force that through the years has numbered into the thousands. A missionary force that God has used to see tens of thousands of souls saved and thousands of churches established. Missionary-led Bible schools and seminaries have trained pastors and Christian leaders to carry on the ministry. And our Bible Translation Society has provided God's Word to those who had never read the Bible in their own language. So we say thank you. Thank you for being an integral part of this ministry. Rejoice with us for what has been accomplished to God's glory. By anyone's standard, 2020 has been an unusual year. The pandemic has affected ministry worldwide. And like you, our missionary family has adapted and risen to the challenges of ministry during COVID-19. Let me share a few of the highlights. In the jungles of Peru, the quarantine provided new ministry opportunities. From his rooftop each night, one of our missionaries led neighbors in singing Peru's national anthem and saluting the police and military. Then on Sundays, he preached from the rooftop through a loudspeaker. Their closest neighbors, Ander and Beitzabe, listened through a crack in the wall. 
each decided to trust Christ as their savior and others listened and received the Lord as well. Local high school officials in South Africa contacted our missionaries about providing food for students, some of whose parents had lost their jobs because of shutdowns. The team printed gospel cards and cooked and boxed 85 meals in three weeks. They also set up an online chat so those students could reach out for help in dealing with depression and stress due to the lockdowns. In Holland, our missionaries were forced to postpone April baptisms. They were rescheduled in June and July, held outside, and split into two separate events complying with mandated group sizes, but still allowing these believers to give testimony and to obey the Lord. In a creative access nation, our missionaries dedicated a church building addition enabling them to seat 1,000 people. They also celebrated their 1,099th baptism and dedicated the 15th daughter church which was started through the outreach of the church's own missionaries. A 16th daughter church is currently under construction. In Cambodia, the church held their annual Bible conferences during the Buddhist holidays to provide believers with an alternative obligation to participate in so they could excuse themselves when pressured by family to take part in ancestor worship. Instead, they studied the living word and praised the living creator together. Because of a rise in COVID-19 cases and because the church's air conditioning wasn't working, the staff at a downtown Cleveland, Ohio ministry canceled their August vacation Bible school. In its place, one missionary took to the road with a VBS on God's creation. Bringing a decorated wagon, crafts, snacks, and mats for the kids, she taught two different groups of kids in front of their homes. A total of 40 children attended and learned about the power of God and the magnificence of his creation. In Peru, as the pressure of strict quarantine regulations found many without funds for basic necessities, our missionaries handed out food and essential supplies. Altogether, 100 people have made professions of faith in Christ, and over 30 of those continue in Bible studies to this day. This is just a small sampling of what God has done through the gospel in 2020. And the great thing is this, your church has had a part in reaching those people for Christ. You are the ones who have prayed. You are the ones who have given. You're the ones who have sent the missionaries to reach people for Christ. And so we're thankful for the part that you have played in that. Those missionaries have sown the seeds, they've watered, and God has given the increase. We thank God for what he has done, but we also wanna thank you for the vital role that you have played in spreading the gospel of Christ across the globe. BMM enjoys a wonderful partnership with churches like yours in taking the gospel to a world that needs Christ. Turn in your Bibles, if you will, this evening to the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And while you're turning to that passage of Scripture, I, I do want to thank you for the part your church has played. There are about 8,000 churches that support Baptist Midmissions Ministries, as well as about 13,000 individuals, most of whom do that through their local church. This evening, I want us to think about thank you. That's why I'm here, is to thank you. But I simply don't want to say thank you. I want you to understand why. Sometimes we say something to our children and they say, why? You remember that? We have four children. <clears throat> the third one asked it four times more than the other three combined. He's a lawyer today, quite successful. But sometimes we wonder why we do what we do. And as I've come this evening to say thank you <clears throat> for Baptist Missions to you, I want you to understand why that I'm doing that. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, in verse 18, Paul, as he's wrapping up this letter to the Thessalonian church, gives a list of rapid-fire commands. They're all important, but the one that I think fits with us this evening is in verse 18, where Paul says this, in everything, give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. In everything. And it is God's will that we do that. And we'll find out why in just a moment. Pray with me, would you please? 
Heavenly Father, we are grateful this evening for the opportunity to be here at Thompson Road Baptist Church. Lord, it's my first opportunity to visit, although it's not my first opportunity to have touch with this church and the missionaries that they've sent. And I'm thank, I thank you so much for them and for the privilege they have given us to be here this evening to thank them on behalf of Baptist Mid-Missions. But Lord, as we look at this idea of thanks this evening, my prayer is that I would rightly divide the word of truth and we will see why it says in 1 Thessalonians that it is the will of God that we give thanks in everything. So I pray that you would guide my thoughts, guide my lips and my mouth, and may the things I say please you this evening. And for that, I will give you thanks in Jesus' name and for his sake, amen. Years ago, I read the story of a man who was quite wealthy. Really, most of his wealth was wrapped up in art. He was a collector of art. And he had one of the most exquisite uh, displays of art of anyone in the world at that particular time. But that man had a single son. He was a very ordinary boy, and he was quite sickly, actually. And in his late teens, this boy died. The father loved him so very much that only a few weeks later, he died as well from a broken heart. And so it was time to dispose of all of his earthly goods. His will stipulated that when they came to the auction of all of his things, everything was to be auctioned, that a portrait of his son would be the first item that would be offered. It was an oil painting. And so the day arrived, a huge crowd gathered because they knew of the importance of many of those pieces of art that that man owned. But stipulated in the will that the first thing to be sold was that painting of his son. And so the auctioneer raised the painting and said, do I hear a bid? And there was absolute silence. No one offered anything. Until finally an elderly man who at one time had been a servant of that wealthy man, raised his hand and he said, I will give you 75 cents because I know that boy. The auctioneer asked for other bids and there were none. And so <clears throat> that painting of that young boy, sickly as he was, sold for 75 cents. At that moment, in the auction, the man's lawyer came forward. And he said, stipulated in the man's will is this, that the person who buys the portrait of his son will become the sole inheritor of everything that man owns, because that person loves the son. Quite the story, isn't it? For believers, every single one of us have every reason in the world to be thankful. I believe that believers should be the most thankful people in all of the world. But I want to say something to you. Our joy, our thankfulness should come as a direct result of our love for the Son. In other words, I don't believe it's true thankfulness. I appreciate this evening Pastor Stephen's willingness to have me here. I can remember, it was two years ago in October, four of us were gathered in my office. We had been appointed by the president of the mission to come together to determine how we were going to celebrate our 100th anniversary. And we talked about a number of things and events that would take place, most of which have been canceled this year. But I remember well as we discussed things that we felt were of utmost importance, one of them was being able to thank churches. And so we sent out a letter to churches saying, we have this video ready, but we really would like to come say this in person. I think when you say it in person, it means a whole lot more. And so I'm grateful that you've allowed me to be here this evening. On October the 15th, 1920, 100 years ago, but on 2020, 
we celebrated 100 years of God allowing us to serve churches and their missionaries. A hundred years. But I want you to understand something. It all began in a church. A pastor. His name was William Haas. He pastored Memorial Baptist Church in Columbus, Ohio. One of my colleagues was there to preach this morning. He was 35 years old. He had been saved at an early age. He had a mother who prayed for him that he would one day be a missionary. He struggled with that. William Haas said to God, I will do anything you want me to do, but please, Lord, don't send me to Africa. We've all heard that one, haven't we? It was very true in his life. And finally, he came to a time in his early 20s that he said, Lord, I've come to the conclusion that if you're Lord, you're Lord. And so I will go anywhere you want me to go. And God sent him into the pastorate for a number of years. He was pastoring the Memorial Baptist Church in 1908. And there, the Lord allowed him that opportunity. If you would read the business meeting minutes, it simply says, Pastor resigned to go to the mission field. That was 1908. But just a couple of years prior to that, that in a two-year period, he buried his mother, he buried his wife, and he buried both of his daughters. And so he felt, I'm free to go. And so he began that process of getting ready to go to Africa. And God gave him a wife and a son. And in 1911, they landed on the shore of, of Africa, the eastern shore. And there he met a man whom many who know anything about missions would know. His name was C.T. Studd. Studd was a famous cricket player in England who gave his life to Christ, and he went as a missionary to Africa. C.T. Studd met William Haas there on the shore. Haas was a brilliant man, actually. He could speak five languages. He taught himself Greek and Hebrew. And he was very proficient in both of those languages. And C.T. Studd encouraged him to start translating the scriptures for the African people. But William Haas said, God did not call me to translate scripture. My main thrust is to reach those people who have never heard. So with his wife, they went to the interior of Africa into what then was known as French Equatorial Africa. And there for four years they served. They came home. They had started with a non-denominational mission agency who had promised them that if they would come, they could start Baptist churches. But when they arrived there, they felt that was not the case, and so he resigned from that mission agency with all of his support and still stayed four years. They came back home in 1915. Those who met them on the dock in New York said they were more dead than alive. But they did begin to recover. And a year later, in 1916, William Haas went back to Africa. His wife and son were both still too ill to go. And he spent another three years there as he worked in that area, winning people to Christ. In 1919, late 1919, he came home again. And William Haas realized that if I die... My ministry will die with me. I need to have a group of recruits, and I need to have churches behind me that will support this ministry long beyond me. And so in early October of 1920, he sent letters to 12 pastors and Christian businessmen in a five-state area and invited them to Elyria, Ohio, to First Baptist Church. First Baptist had loaned them a prayer room for that meeting. It's interesting that a hundred years later, that Judy and I are members of that church. But on that day, the 20th of October, 1920, those men, after meeting and praying, formed the General Council of Cooperating Baptist Missions of North America, Incorporated. You had to have a three-by-five for a business card. The name was so long. 
And so in December, Haas left with five recruits. And by February, they were in the French Equatorial Africa region. In 1924, William Haas became ill and died. He never had a single idea what would happen to that mission agency that he had formed just a few years earlier. And he, was, he entered into the presence of his Savior. But God knew what he was doing. And here we are, a hundred years later, with missionaries in 54 different countries that are serving the Lord. Aren't you glad that God knows what he's doing? I certainly am. And so he was, he was there and he died. But his ministry continued. Why? Because he had found those that would succeed him. And he trained them to carry on. I find it very interesting that the five recruits, most of them serve between 40 and 50 years on the mission field. We have so much to be thankful for at Baptist Mid-Missions. But I told you when I began, I'm not here simply to say thanks. I'm here to tell you why. We ought to be thankful. So follow with me, please. I have three simple thoughts this evening. The first is this. The Bible gives us an idea of a thankful heart. Let me say this. I've already said it, that our our thankfulness stems from our love for God. But I also believe that it finds root as we realize that everything that we have received comes from outside of ourself. All of it. It doesn't come from within. It comes from outside. And you and I both know that the American dream tells us, and we are bombarded with this all of the time, that we can do anything we want to do. We can be anything we want to be if we simply try. I love America. I'm grateful to be an American, but that dream is a hoax, my friend. We cannot do anything of ourselves. absolutely nothing. It all comes from outside of us. Not only can we not save ourselves, we don't even have the capacity within us to follow and serve God. Have you ever thought about that? Paul talks about it in Romans chapter 7. He says, and he's talking about being a believer. He says, those things that I want to do, those are the things that I don't. And the things that I don't want to do, those are the very things that I do. And he then says, oh, wretched man that I am, who can save me from this? And then that glorious exaltation from the pen of Paul, I thank God through Jesus Christ, my Lord. Thankfulness occurs when we realize we have absolutely nothing of ourselves, and yet God in His goodness brings things to us. It is God who empowers us. Have you ever thought about that for just a moment? How does God empower you and me? I believe He gives us strength. There are times in our Christian life, and as we endeavor to serve Him, when we come to a point that we think we don't have any more to give. You ever been there? I have. I didn't have anything else I could give God. And in that moment, it was God who gave me the strength to carry on. Not only does he give us strength, he gives us wisdom. Have you ever been in a situation in your service for God and you just didn't know exactly what to do and that passage from James came to your mind? If any of you lack wisdom, ask of God who gives to all men liberally and when we ask, he gives. And he gives us direction for what it is we need to do. But you know something? I believe God gives us strength. And I believe God gives us wisdom. 
But I also believe that God empowers us in our service by giving us other individuals to walk along the path with us. Let me say to you, that certainly has been true of Baptist Midmissions. William Haas found it true with those five who walked beside him. But there are thousands of others who have walked beside. And there are thousands of churches like Thompson Road Baptist Church, who have walked beside us. So as we celebrate 100 years, we realize it really isn't much that Baptist Midmissions has done. It really is God's empowerment through power, through wisdom, and through the help of other people that have allowed us to come to this day. We recognize you. We applaud you, Thompson Road Baptist Church. You have given of your finest. I think of Ed and Sylvia Christie. Ed was in Judy and my candidate class back in 1985. We both remember saying to each other, he needs a wife. (laughs) And God provided another to walk with him. And I remember Michelle Harrison at the time. I was in church relations and enlistment for 19 years before I came to operations. And I remember when Michelle came through candidate school. And I will remember when she wrote us and said, I believe God has given me a young man to be a husband. And I remember going through the process with Harrison. And I remember corresponding with Pastor Slutes as to what Thompson Road Baptist Church would feel. And you have given of your finest, and you have given of your resources. And it is because what you as a church and other churches like yours have done that Baptist Midmissions can say, thank you, God, for what we have been able to do together. You know, and I say this with all sincerity, and I do not mean to sound critical when I say this, but individuals who believe that they have the capacity to serve God and that they have something to offer God are terribly mistaken. And those kind of individuals will not be thankful people because they see it from within themselves. But those who recognize their weakness, those who realize their need of others, those who have placed their dependency upon Christ's provision They will be thankful people. So the idea of a thankful heart is this. Everything we have has been given to us outside of ourselves. Second, notice with me please, the illustrations of a thankful heart. All throughout Scripture, we find individuals who are giving thanks to God and for various reasons. For my time tonight, I have chosen simply four of them. And those reasons for which these individuals gave thanks, I believe tied directly to the mission endeavor. The first one that I think of is Jesus Christ himself. Jesus chose 12 in Luke chapter 6. It says he prayed all night long whom he will choose. Was it that Jesus didn't know who the 12 were going to be? Of course not. He knew exactly who they were going to be. I believe as he prayed all night, he prayed for them as they were about to face something that was much larger than they were. But then you come to chapter 10 of the book of Luke, and we read there that Jesus sent out 70 others, it says. And they were to go throughout all of the region proclaiming that the kingdom of God was at hand. And they did. And they came back and they were so thrilled at what they had seen. And they came to Jesus and they said to him, Lord, this has been incredible. Wow, what ministry. Even the demons were subject to us. Jesus said to them, that's great. That's just wonderful. But let me say something to you. He said, even more important than the demons being subject to you is the fact that that your names are written in heaven. That's what he said to them. 
Your names are written in heaven. And then there's like an aside there in Luke chapter 10, where it says that Jesus said in the Spirit, it was an internal prayer. And he said this to the Father in Luke 10, 21. I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent and has revealed them to babes. And the passage goes on, and Jesus says, There have been prophets and many before you who would have loved to see the things that you are witnessing. To see that God has revealed that salvation has come to man. And can I say this to you? It is the revelation of God that man can be in a right relationship with him because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. That is the message of missions. And Jesus said, Father, I am so glad that this message is now revealed. And that is the message that we carry in missions. We should be thankful for revelation. Then we come to David. David in Psalm 107 verse 8 says this, Oh, that men would praise the Lord for His goodness. We say this, and maybe sometimes tritely, God is good, and then we add, all the time. But do you know something? He is. All the time. And we should be grateful for God's goodness. As I stand here and I begin to think about at least the last 35 years of Baptist Mid-Missions history because that's my time frame with the mission. We have so much for which to be thankful. For the provision of God's choicest servants. For the provision of resources. And I think of the provision of protection. If you go back through 100 years of ministry, And we have been in some really difficult places. Judy and I served a 10-year period in Peru before I was asked to come back to the administration. We served eight of those 10 years in a time in Peru, which was the time of horrible terrorism. The Shining Path movement was taking over Peru. The night we landed in Peru, they had cut off all the power to the airport. It was a terrible time. But in 100 years of ministry, we have had only one single individual who has been a martyr for Christ's cause. Just one. I think of that and praise God for his goodness. Then there's Solomon, David's son. This is one of my favorite passages in all of the Scripture. When I was in Peru and I was teaching in the seminary, I, I taught the theology of worship. And I would always come to this passage. Where the temple has been built, we have listed there those who are going to praise the Lord. And they do, and the choirs come in and they sing and they praise God for His goodness. It's been a long time since you and I probably have been in a service quite like that. Because when they finished the singing, and the praising of God. There's an interesting verse in that chapter in 2 Chronicles. It's in verse chapter 6. It says, when they finished the worship, God was so pleased with what he heard that his glory filled the temple. And it says that the priests couldn't even serve. Because of God's presence. And you come to chapter 7. And I read this in verse 3. When all the elders of Israel saw how the fire came down. And the glory of the Lord upon the house. They bowed themselves with their faces to the ground upon the pavement. And worshipped and praised the Lord saying. For he is good. For his mercy endures forever. A thankful heart. We'll thank God for His mercy, and in context of this particular chapter, His presence. Aren't you grateful for God's presence? When we think of the Great Commission as given in Matthew and in Mark, 
We think about going into all the world and making disciples, baptizing and all of those things, and it's really, really easy to miss the last portion of that where God says, Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the earth. We have some missionaries in remote places, and I have heard their testimony say, the moment I felt so alone and so discouraged, it was then I remembered God is there. We have much for which to be thankful. And as a mission agency, we are grateful for God's presence. And then probably the greatest missionary of all, the Apostle Paul. He also was grateful. And he thanked God for illumination. Now, revelation and illumination are not the same. Revelation is God making known what man needs and what God has done. Illumination is the Holy Spirit's work in the heart of man to appropriate that truth for one's own self and be totally regenerated and brought back into right relationship with God. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 13. Here's what he says. For this cause also, we thank God without ceasing, because when ye received the word of God, which ye heard of us, ye received it not as the word of men, but as it is in truth. Paul preached in all kinds of places. There were places where he preached and almost nothing happened. As a matter of fact, there were places he preached and he was thrown out of the city. But he came to the town of Thessalonica and he preached there. And it was the Spirit of God that moved greatly in the hearts of those people and illumined them and they didn't take it as Paul's words. They took it as it is, the very truth of God. And Paul was so grateful for the illumination of God. And I can stand before you tonight and say to you, where Baptist mid-missionaries have taken the truth, the Spirit of God has worked and has opened hearts. I know in our own ministry there were individuals that were so difficult, we thought we would never see them come to the Savior. And yet, God illumined them, and they came to Him. So there are illustrations of a grateful heart. So there's the idea of a thankful heart. That's a heart who realizes that everything that it has received has come from outside of itself. It had nothing to offer. There are illustrations of a grateful heart through these individuals that I just mentioned. But then there's a third thing I want you to notice, and this is where it applies to you and me tonight. That is the implication of a thankless or thankful heart. I want us to think on both sides of that coin as I wrap this up this evening. Negatively, this would be the thankless heart. I've read my Bible through numerous times, and there are lots of portions of Scripture that are difficult. But I believe, at least for me, that the saddest chapter in all of Scripture is Romans chapter 1. For it is in Romans chapter 1 that you find the decline of man to his worst state. There's a constant declension beginning in verse 21. Here's what it says. Because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Do you know something? That all began when they didn't recognize God, and what's the next step? Neither were they thankful. And you read verse 21 to 28, and it's just like stair steps going to a basement. You go down and down, and down, and down. And in verse 28, it says, And God gave them over to a reprobate mind. Now, 
When we hear the word reprobate, we would often think of vile, sinful individuals, and that they were. But it says he gave them over to a reprobate mind. Those actions are simply the result of something else. As I have studied that word reprobate, it carries the idea of a mind that cannot come to a correct conclusion. It comes to conclusions, but it can't come to correct conclusions. It is as if it has been short-circuited. And it began when they were unthankful and did not recognize God. Young William Haas, as he struggled with the call of God in his life, finally came to that day when he realized, I am not glorifying God if I will not do what He wants me to do. I'm not even thankful for what He has done for me. And Lord, so here I am. I have a question. Are we glorifying God in our lives? I will say to you, if we do not regularly rehearse all that God has done for us and we recognize that it came from outside of us, and if we are not thankful for what He's done for us, we are not glorifying God. We're not. We should be a thankful people. But I don't want to dwell there. There is a positive side to all of this. There are the implications of a thankful heart. It's positive. First of all, I would say there is a recognition of partnerships. Here's what Paul says in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 11, as he writes to that church. You also, helping together by prayer for us, that for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanks may be given by many on our behalf. In other words, Paul said, God has allowed me to preach in a lot of places. And I'm grateful for that opportunity, but it was the prayer of God's people. And specifically, he's addressing that church in Corinth, and he said, it was your prayers on our behalf that has resulted in fruit. And he's thanking them for it. And that's why I'm here tonight, to thank you for your prayers. Yes, I'm thankful for the individuals you've sent And I'm thankful for your financial gifts. We were talking about this the other day. How many prayers have gone upwards to heaven for the ministry of Baptist mid-missions? And that has been what has made the difference. The partnership with others. Thank you. A thankful heart will not only recognize partnerships, it will also recognize souls saved. Here's what Paul says to the Thessalonian church in 2 Thessalonians 2.13. We are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Do you remember when Jesus was on earth and he preached? Who were those that resisted him the most? The religious people, the Pharisees. When people came to Christ, they never rejoiced. He gave a series of parables on the importance of rejoicing when people come to Christ. A thankful heart will always be grateful for that. I mentioned to you that in um, 1920, William Haas went with five people to the Central African Republic to begin the ministry of Baptist Midmissions. And today, on any given Sunday, across that country, when it's time for church, more than 10,000 people come to worship. 10,000. Can you imagine that? People you've never met, but people for whom you've prayed. And in Peru, where Judy and I served, missionaries arrived there in the late 30s, early 40s, And by 1972, six churches had been established. They were strong churches, one of them upwards of 500 people. 
But the missionaries realized if we are going to reach this country for Christ, we have to train nationals to do the work. And so a seminary was begun. I mentioned that both of us taught there for a number of years. And today, in any given Sunday in Peru, there are more than a thousand independent Baptist churches that meet on a Sunday, like you meet. Praise the Lord is right. Those are two countries out of 54. Grateful hearts thank God for what He's done in lives, just as Paul did. And then finally, and I will close with this, there is a gratitude for a secure future. The book of Revelation, chapter 11, and verse 17, it's about halfway through that book, that there is a break in the movement, and you find this word of exaltation and thanks. It says, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, because thou hast taken to thee thy great power and hast reigned. We live in really uncertain times. I think you know that. You didn't need me to come tell you that. But we do. We live in uncertain times. We do not know what the days ahead mean for believers. But in a sense, we do. Because we have the book of Revelation. Because Jesus is going to rule. He is going to take control. He is going to reign. And your future and my future, we are secure in Him because of our faith in what he has done. And all of those people that I just mentioned that have been reached have that same security. A thankful heart thanks him for what he has done, for what he is doing, and for what he has yet to do. And we can be certain of that. So what can I say in conclusion as I close? As children of God, we have a lot to be thankful for. We could spend the rest of our lives just saying thank you. But as I close, I want you to think with me about this. I hope you will pray, and I pray this way every day. Lord, help me to see my weakness. Help me to understand that without you, I can't do anything. When I see my weakness, it makes me thankful for what he does. May we recognize his greatness. And may we praise him for who he is. May we glorify him, what the people in Romans chapter 1 did not. And above all, may we respond with grateful service. When we recognize our weakness and we understand God's greatness, that should move us to grateful service and say to God, whatever it is, wherever you want, I will do exactly what you want me to do. Pray with me, would you please? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. I am so grateful for its power. Lord, you know my my normal mode of preaching would not be like this. It would be more expository in nature of taking a text and being able to open it. But on this special occasion that has not lent itself to that, I trust that what I've said has been pleasing to you. But I pray most of all that what I've said has impacted hearts. There may be someone here this evening who still has that idea somehow embedded within them that they're able to serve you, that they're able to accomplish things. Oh, Lord, tonight, would you please remind all of us of our weakness, of our inability? It is only through your power that we can do what we otherwise could not. And, Lord, would you help us to be thankful people, not as those in Romans 1, but people who look to you and see you for who you are and for what you have done And Lord, may that make us grateful. But may we not just have come this evening to say thanks or to hear thanks. But may what we have heard, may that motivate us to serve you gratefully and make a difference in people's lives. For that is what 
you want from us. I ask you to do this in our hearts tonight, in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Pastor, would you come, please? Amen. Thank you, Brother Fultz, for that, that challenge. And we indeed have much to be thankful for. And what I'd like you to do is invite you to stand to your feet. And we'll close by singing just the chorus of thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. We'll sing a cappella and ask our instruments to just <laughs> draw us Sorry, Brother Howard. Uh, we'll just, ju just our voices, we all join together, sing this as a, a prayer of thanks to the, what God has done. Thank you, Lord, for saving my soul. Thank you, Lord, for making me whole. Thank you, Lord, for giving to me thy great salvation so rich and free. Amen. Well, thank you so much for coming. Thank you for the Lord. Thanks to the Lord for everything he has done for us. You are dismissed.